recording in progress. Um, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I think we've got some new faces here, and welcome back to everybody who, well, who was with us all the way through last year. It was really incredible, um, and I'm really looking forward to this next eight weeks. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Lawrence now, who's going to give an introductory presentation on our text. Over to you, Lawrence. Aaron, thank you. And um, it's really great to see everybody again. Um, uh, 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 I'm really delighted because we, we put we have not really uh, envisaged carrying on this term uh, with the reading group, but we uh, well we enjoyed ourselves so much last term that we thought that um, uh, we hoped you uh, did as well. And it seemed right um, from uh, working with the Parmenides text then to work with this other text of Heidegger's, um, which dates from about the same time, but has a number of important features to it that um, uh, are related to the Parmenides text, but not directly, but nevertheless um, throw light on both what we were looking at, but also throw light on Heidegger's thought more generally and more importantly. I'm going to give a just a background presentation today. Um, uh, so I'm, this today will be a slightly shorter session, although we're going to open up for a discussion at the end and I hope um, people will feel able to contribute, um, though I'd stress that only if you want to. Um, we will then begin to read the text properly uh, as from next week. I'm going to make one other plea. Uh, I, we didn't press the issue of working with the German um, partly because I think both Aaron and I were finding our way around Zoom as a medium, uh, and I'm sure perhaps some of you were as well. Um, a, a reading group works very differently to, let's say, a teaching situation or uh, a learning situation. Um, I think I now understand much more about how Zoom works um, and certainly have found it much less of an obstacle than I thought. This is quite a short text. Um, and so I'm strongly going to encourage you, if I may, even if you don't have much German or aren't used to the German, to work with it as best you can, um, uh, to look, use the English and the German alongside each other. Because um, first of all, as you will have noticed, I am translating the German myself, at least not everybody needs to be convinced uh, with the way I'm doing it, but, but um, I, at least if, um, I'm translating the German rather differently uh, to the way that a lot of the translators have translated texts in the past. I want to turn, if I may, we circulated a, uh, a more general kind of background text, uh, and I want just to talk through that uh, in the first instance. Um, I then want to make a few observations about what, where the question of the essence of truth stands more widely in the philosophical tradition. Um, and finally, I want uh, simply to talk about how we will, con uh, con uh, 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 how we will conduct the, um, uh, uh, the, the reading group as we proceed. One of the reasons why we chose this text was because for a long time, it has a reputation for being the text in which the so-called turn of Martin Heidegger takes place. The question is, what is the turn? You could argue that it, the dikera, the turn as it's been understood in the English uh, uh, speaking literature, very much flowed from Bill Richardson's analysis of there being a Heidegger one and a Heidegger two. And if you know Bill Richardson's work, and it's still, in my opinion, one of the most remarkable edifices of scholarship on Heidegger around, some of these um, older uh, uh, edifices are extremely valuable and have not been superseded. I mean, the work of Vincent Vikinas would be another. Um, uh, uh, they are extremely informative. And they clearly were in touch with developments in Heidegger's work, which have not been surpassed. Bill Richardson wrote to Heidegger and asked him if he would write an introduction to the book. Heidegger duly replied. 
And Heidegger said something in that introduction, which to a certain extent Richardson glossed over. Richardson announced that in uh, 1930, in the uh, lecture from Wesen der Wahrheit, the, uh, he says, here Heidegger II emerges out of Heidegger I. And Heidegger replied in his introductory text, which is now in the Gesamtausgabe, and I've given the reference to it uh, in the uh, text that we've circulated, that if they, there is a Heidegger I and a Heidegger II, Heidegger said, then it must be understood that Heidegger I is explained by Heidegger II and not the other way around. Now, Richardson sort of pretended that Heidegger hadn't said that. And it is an extraordinary statement. But I think after long reflection of my own work on Heidegger, it is entirely true. Now, in my PhD thesis, I argued strongly that there was no Heidegger I or Heidegger II really, that this was a false distinction. And so something I'm going to draw our, us back to as we consider this text in the coming weeks is a remark that Heidegger makes, not in so much in this text, but in a number of other places. And it's the remark he makes, it, it appears in the letter of, on, on humanism. Uh, he says in the letter on humanism, the lecture on the essence of truth thought out and delivered in 1930, but only published in 1943, offers a certain insight into the thinking of the turning from being to, and time to time and being. And then Heidegger says that the thinking of this turning was not helped, he says, by the language of metaphysics. And so you'll often find commentators saying, ah, this just shows that being and time was written in the language of metaphysics, and even some commentators have argued that the letter on humanism was written in the language of metaphysics. And that it, as it were, was metaphysics and that part of Heidegger's own task was to try and extricate himself from a language of metaphysics. Now, since Richardson's book, a vast amount of material of Heidegger's has entered the public domain which I've tended to, it doesn't really go under a single uh, name, um, but I've tended to call, the Heide, uh, call it the Heidegger Nachlass. It breaks down into a number of areas. There are the seven volumes. Um, in fact, there were far more notebooks in those volumes, but there are seven in the series, one of which is not yet published. That um, Friedrich Wilhelm von Hermann, the editor of the Heidegger Gesamtausgabe has called the Ereignis series. That begins with the text that, uh, uh, within it that's best known, which is the uh, volume um, Beiträge zur Philosophie vom Ereignis. Uh, um, I've, the English title, it's on my desk, but I can't see the book, is um, Contributions to Philosophy um, from Inoning. I think that was one of the titles. There are two translations of it. The first translation, uh, by Parvis Imad um, and one other was uh, very problematic and contained statements that were frankly, well, or interpretations that were frankly erroneous or highly over-interpretative. And there is a second translation which is far more accurate, but even that one has its problems, partly because the, the volume itself is so difficult. But that was the first of the volumes, but there are several more. They run in a whole series. Then there are two absolutely enormous volumes that run into 15 pages of commentary text on the Fomir Eignis series. Finally, there are the black notebooks. As you will know, some of those are extremely controversial. They contain some of Heidegger's most anti-Semitic remarks, and yet there are only 13 passages of that kind. It doesn't, by the way, when I say only, I'm not underplaying the significance of Heidegger's anti-Semitism, but rather, the black notebooks are very, are very much not all about Heidegger's anti-Semitism. There is a great deal of other material, but there's probably about 4,000 pages of printed text in the black notebooks in total, of which 13 contain these highly problematic, quite reprehensible um, uh, anti-Semitic statements. 
And then in addition to that, there are other volumes that it's difficult to place that contain various observations and notes on um, Heidegger's work. All of this material, probably at least a third of the Gesamtausgabe, if not more, one would place in the general, um, uh, uh, under the general heading of Anachlas. Some of it is arguably, I think, almost impossible to interpret. It's not clear to me that it, uh, Heidegger actually wanted it put in the public domain. There is there's considerable controversy there with voices on all sides. Um, Theodore Cassiel has been one of the people uh, who died not that long ago, but has been one of the people who's been most critical of the way that the uh, Heidegger Gesamtausgabe has been edited and argues that it was never Heidegger's intention to put this material into the public domain. Others have taken a very different view. Some of it is extremely helpful. Some of it is experimental. Um, much of it is extremely difficult to translate. I reviewed a volume um, uh, uh, for translation uh, of, of it quite recently. And although um, the uh, translator was, ex it was clear to me extremely competent in German, and in fact, I had a good record of um, translating German. I, I really felt for the translator. The translator was really struggling to make sense of this material. It, it's not surprising. It was written in extremely cryptic, often Delphic uh, ways that certainly even I was struggling at times to understand what I thought Heidegger meant. Um, uh, I, I, he was relatively new, I think, to uh, uh, in uh, translating Heidegger, and I think was was understandably finding it difficult. But publishers have been keen to buy up the licenses for this and to try and get this material into the public domain. Why am I uh, pointing out that there is all this material? Because I think this material is the real Heidegger too, and it presents a very different Heidegger to the Heidegger that went into the public domain. Heidegger, who is this, it's quite voluminous, as it were, the material that was published in Heidegger's lifetime, but it's probably only 20%, if that, of the Heidegger Gesamtausgabe. It constitutes the first 14 or 15 volumes of the Gesamtausgabe, of which there are going to be 102, um, although some of them are double volumes. Um, I think in total there will be about 105, and I think there are only three or four volumes still to come out, apart from the lessers. Um, there is therefore a Heidegger too, a, a, a Heidegger that Heidegger himself held back in his private work, some of which it's clear he did want published. It's absolutely clear that he wanted the Beiträge zur Philosophie to be published. He was certainly extremely jealous of the way a great deal of this material um, was to be prepared. And he and his brother, um, who typed up his uh, notes in many cases into typescripts, and certainly during the war, they shifted the material out of Freiburg uh, up to Tottenauburg, um, or in fact, I think to where Heidegger was born and where the Heidegger family still had a, a, a presence um, uh, uh, in, for safekeeping. But it's clear that Heidegger wanted at least some of this material um, to be preserved. Heidegger says, therefore, that at times he writes deliberately using the language of metaphysics. He says this about the letter on humanism, and I think it's because the letter on humanism, if it has an audience as such, above all, that audience um, was Jean-Paul Sartre. And Heidegger was extremely um, wary of Sartre's, much of Sartre's interpretation of Heidegger's own work. Heidegger had been for at least 10 years before the letter on humanism, um, denouncing the suggestion that he himself was an existential or existentialist philosopher in no way, uh, he thought. And he particularly disliked the way that Sartre um, translated uh, the, the, word, the German word Dasein. Sartre's translation of Dasein was Etrala, exactly the same in French as the Macquarie Robinson translation selected for Dasein 
in English, the, uh, being there, être là, being there. Uh, at one point, there are three places, in fact, where Heidegger criticizes, criticizes this um, uh, uh, translation, but in one place, in a public conference, which we have the transcript of, Heidegger challenged Karl Lovett in public. He said, the da of Dasein, how do you translate that? And Lovett replied, être là, because the conference was in France. And Heidegger says, nein, no. And then he says, it can be translated être le la, being the there, but it cannot be translated as being there. The there being, the da sein, the da of da sein, really mattered. This is Heidegger II. And this Heidegger II was without doubt held back. And it's absolutely clear that Heidegger wanted the Heidegger I to be well understood before the reader, whoever she or he was, moved on to try to tackle Heidegger too. In fact, Heidegger, if it's claimed, it's not entirely clear, Cassiel disagreed, but it's claimed that Heidegger wanted the transcripts of all his lecture courses to be published before any of the Nachlass material was released. That didn't happen. There was a strong desire by the Heidegger family to get the Beiträge zur Philosophie out into the public domain in time for the centenary of Heidegger's birth in 1989, and that was indeed the year that it was published. And so it's been out um, for quite a while. But that poses an important question about this very text, because the lecture from Wesen der Wahrheit, or three versions of it, were written in 1930. And then, as I explained in the material that we circulated, the material was substantially revised in 1940 and published in 1943. In fact, I have a copy, if anyone's interested, here is the 1943 edition printed on wartime quality paper. It's extremely fragile, but I managed to track one down. Um, and, and there it is. Um, uh, in 1949, Heidegger added um, or, or, uh, a, a, a number of paragraphs to the last section, which in the 1943 edition hadn't been numbered. It had simply been titled Anmerkung, remark, if you like, or, or, or concluding remark. In the 1949 edition, the concluding remark gets um, its own number, becomes number nine, and it's substantially revised. There are no other revisions to the text earlier on. A second edition of the 1949 text was published in 1954. You will find in many of the commentators, uh, th two of whom, in fact, I, I can think of, that there are differences between the 1954 version and the 1949 version. Well, I have the 1949 edition here. I feel a bit like American show and tell. Uh, and I also have the 1954 edition. And the reason I have them is because I didn't believe that that claim was true and I wanted to check it. And I can assure you, you have it now from somebody who's seen these texts. Um, there is no substantial difference between the 1949 and the 1954 edition. So why does that claim arise? Because in the Gesamtausgabe edition, which was published after Heidegger died, his own personal remarks in both the 1943 and the 1949 editions were transcribed into, they, they were written in the margins. And for some reason or other, he wrote several remarks in his own copy of the 1954 edition. All of these were transcribed as footnotes into the version that arrives in the Gesamtausgabe. We don't know when many of these revisions were made. Uh, in fact, we don't. Then he, he didn't date his revisions. But the version that we are going to read, therefore, in the coming weeks, is the version that went into the 1949 uh, 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 the, of the 1949 edition with its footnotes and additional remarks that appeared in the Gesamtausgabe edition, and that is the one that was. Uh, amended with jo uh, John Salas translated um, the 1949 edition first, and that Salas translation has found itself 
into the Cambridge University Press edition called Pathmarks of the Gizantas Gaba volume, and that's the one we're going to look at. It has the remarks. What changed between 1930 and 1943? Well, quite a bit. Um, and we have the, now the texts of the three versions that were given as public lectures in 1930. And they were published in volume 80 of the Gesamthaus Gaba under the title, of, it's, it's a double volume, but they, they appeared in the first volume, which I think came out in 2018 or 2018 or possibly 2019. They also have additional remarks. Some of these are dated and that's extremely useful. They're extremely useful from our point of view because they would, many of the remarks that were made, especially to the third, third version, which is the, the more rounded out version, they're very similar. The three versions are quite similar. They were all given within a year of each other. One, I think the first was in January, I think 1930, and the final version was in December, 1930. But we have the additional remarks. Now, we haven't circulated the 1930 version, the December 1930 version, but uh, Aaron and I are going to make it possible for, uh, for it to be downloaded from a web page, and we will send you all a link to that web page. We have one additional uh, um, piece of good news in, in this uh, sense. In 1997, somebody I got to know when I was a PhD student who's still teaching, a man called um, Professor Martin Weatherston um, in the US, um, made a personal translation. There was a bootleg version of the December 1930 version circulating. Uh, I managed to get a copy, hold of a copy when I was a graduate student. Um, Tom Sheehan will happily send out a PDF of, uh, of the same thing and, and various other people had copies. Martin Weatherston made for his own personal use a translation of this in 1997 and he kindly shared it with me when I was a graduate student. I tracked him down and asked him if we could use it. And I've made a scan of it, uh, a searchable scan as well. Um, and uh, he's agreed. Um, so we're going to uh, make that downloadable as well. I don't intend to focus closely on the 1930 version in the course of our reading. It is quite different, and for those of you who have the time, I would strongly uh, advise you to read it. I would suggest M Martin's translation is a good translation, but I would stress it's a working translation. Um, Martin didn't bother to use much of the language that's often used in the Heidegger translations. That's both um, to the benefit and the disbenefit of this uh, of his version. Um, uh, but be wary of using, or at least use his uh, English translations side by side with the German, because it, he, he, it's a scratch translation. It, it's very good, but it's not polished and it hasn't been through um, uh, uh, any other pairs of eyes and so forth. And I think he was a lot younger when he made it, um, uh, uh, although his German's clearly very good. Uh, um, and I suspect he would translate it somewhat differently then. And I've been, I've been amending his version as it, it's gone through. And it's not the, the bootleg version uh, 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 of the typescript that circulated is not quite the same as the, as the version that got into the Gesamtas Garbe edition, which is the one that we're going to make downloadable uh, uh, as a PDF. And it doesn't contain the footnotes. I am going to translate the footnotes um, myself, but I haven't got around to it yet um, because I've had quite a lot else on. And I will put a version that has a translation of the footnotes and the preamble um, uh, uh, up on that download page in due course. Why, what matters, what changes between 1930 and 1949? One could say that almost the whole of Heidegger II was written in the period between 1930 and 1949. Although the Black Notebooks continue to be written right up into the 1960s, um, the Das Ereignis books and the other books of preparatory notes stop being written really 
well, by about 1950, 1955 at the very latest. Heidegger too has fully been worked out, in other words. There are people who will argue that the Heidegger of the 1950s is different from the 1940s. That is to a certain extent true, but oddly enough, the Heidegger of the 1950s is to some degree in the public domain in the sense that the, um, the lecture course from uh, Der Satz von Grund, the essence, of Re uh, the essence of Reasons, and the other lecture course which Derrida made so much of, um, whose name is escaping me for um, just a second, but it's volume eight of the Gesamtausgabe. Um, Was heißt Denken? Also appeared in the 1950s. And th these two texts certainly contain a Heidegger who is reflecting rather differently. There is one glimpse of Heidegger too in the public domain, and that is the Bremen lectures of 1949, the same year that this revised version of von Wesen der Wahrheit is published. The Bremen lectures introduced the term das Gestell, um, which has been translated in lots of different ways, the framework, the framing. Uh, Andrew Mitchell has positionality. Um, the best translation that I have come across so far is placement, um, but that even that needs some explanation. Heidegger gave no explanation about Das Gestell when he simply announced this um, interpretation of, uh, of technology in 1949. But he does in one of the black notebooks, um, but not in, not. But it's only the last one, and it's fascinating. And he makes it absolutely clear that Das Gestell is the prevailing interpretation of Kant's understanding of being um, as position, position. Uh, uh, Kant calls it. Um, and so, if you want to understand technology in a way that's not yet been properly understood, then that's the place to look for it. But 1949 is an important year. Heidegger too is revealed to an audience quite unlike any other audience um, that Heidegger had spoken to ever before. In 1949, Heidegger was forbidden from teaching. He failed the denazification process in 1946, and he was banned from teaching, and in fact, dismissed with a, a reduced pension from the University of Freiburg. And one of his pupils, Heinrich Wiegen Petzert, uh, came from a wealthy um, ship owning family in Bremen, who were members of the Bremen club. It was a sort of bourgeois club, a bit like the um, gentlemen's clubs of Pall Mall, I suppose, uh, in London or um, uh, um, that still exist. And I think the Bremen Club actually still exists. Petzert organized for Heidegger to speak um, at the Bremen Club. So the wealthy and intelligent and often quite educated burghers of Bremen, and perhaps others smuggled themselves in as well, went off to the Bremen Club to hear Professor Martin Heidegger, who presented a version of his work that nobody had ever heard before. Um, it's the only time I think that one can confidently say that the full Heidegger II was presented to a public um, audience. Heidegger did give some of the lectures uh, of, the, of the Bremen series in other places as well. And then the best known of them was revised and rewritten as Die Frage nach dem Technik, um, the question concerning technology, which was published in 1953. What therefore, changes. In 1930, there is no Heidegger too, and Heidegger writes, as it were, still uh, from, uh, from an undivided position. By the time he releases and revises the lecture from Wesen der Wahrheit on the essence of truth in 1949, and adds the crucial section nine, which we, I hope, will spend some time on, not least because in 1949, that section is the, in fact, it's the second mention of Das Sein, spelt with a Y, and an explanation of what it means. Uh, it's the, one of the few places where Heidegger ever bothers to explain what Das Sein means. 
but it's one it's the first, it's the second place where it appears it was first mentioned in 1943 but he'd been writing it in private notes and he'd been lecturing using the phrase das sein as early as 1932 in fact i think the first place that das sein ever appears if it isn't a later revision is in the opening paragraph of the lecture course that this reading group looked at, uh, the 1932 lectures on Parmenides and Anaximander. And I don't think that this connection is accidental. In fact, it's only, I think, with a thorough grounding in Heidegger's interpretation of Anaximander and Parmenides that one can really make sense of the lecture course from Wesen der Wahrheit. And therefore, one can make sense of that claim that Heidegger makes, that to some extent, the turn from, the es from being and true uh, time to time and being is contained in the lecture of 1930. It's at this point, therefore, that I want to move on to um, that claim about the turn itself. If you go, there is a, there is a, 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 an essay that was published, I think, in, in the 1940s. It was one of the Bremen lectures. Um, it's simply called Die Kera, um, that was put into the public domain um, pretty much word for word as it had been delivered in Bremen. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but I think in the early 1950s. Um, you would struggle to find a, a, a thoroughgoing description or an analysis of how being and time became time and being. In the material that Heidegger adds to the 1949 lectures, that section nine that we will spend, I hope, some time on, Heidegger speaks of these sayings of attorney. It becomes a phrase that he uses. But the first saying of a turning is really contained in section eight of being and time itself. Those of you who know the work well will know that being and time is only the first half of a much larger projected work, the second half of which was never produced. For a long time, I think up to the 1940 edition of being and time, it's still um, had the byline first half, Esther, um, Esther Tile, I think, uh, on the volume itself, but the Zweite Tile never appeared. In section eight of the first half of the preamble section, Heidegger describes what the full being and time should have looked like. And the unpublished part begins with a long section, a long proposed section, a section that never appeared on time and being, so that we move from being and time to time and being. In the letter in, on uh, the humanismus brief, the letter on humanism, Heidegger makes clear that there is no turning as such in his work in the sense that there is a change in his thinking, but rather, he says, his thinking contained a change. I think as I've studied Heidegger myself over the years, I am less sure that he was as confident of carrying out that turning in 1927 when he published Being in Time and less clear really what it meant than by 1949 when he published both the letter or 1947 when the letter on humanism is, is uh, written and 1949 when he publishes the full, what we now know as the full version of Von Wesen der Wahrheit on the essence of truth. But nevertheless, there is a key phrase in the 1930 lecture. And it says this, it's on page 390 of, um, uh, uh, of the, um, uh, 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 the Gesamtausgabe edition. He says, der Mensch, man, humanity, if you like, is not the bearer and possessor of truth, um, and freedom, but everything is the other way about. Der Mensch besitzt nicht als Eigenschaft, sondern umgekehrt die Freiheit, das existente entbergende Dasein, besitzt den Menschen, so ursprünglich 
dass sie allein ihn zu, zu einem ihn selbst offenbaren, das heißt existieren, Wesen, Ermöglichkeit. If we can translate this, therefore, as man is not the bearer and possessor of truth and freedom, but everything is other, uh, the other way about. Humanity um, possess, possesses not as a property, um, but the other way around, freedom. Humanity possesses freedom as, uh, a, a, humanity is possessed by freedom, therefore, um, rather than having freedom as a property. And it's the definition of Freiheit that's given in the 1930 lecture that is so important. He says, das Existenz entbergende Dasein. Freedom is the existence. This is a word that Heidegger makes up. If you know your Heidegger well, you will know that he means, he takes an etymology of existence as ex sistere, to be stood out, not to stand out and therefore to project forth, which is entwürfen, but ex sistere is to be already standing out. The human being is that one who is stood out beyond herself, if you like. Um, das existente entbergende, so the, the being stood out, disclosing Dasein. Freedom is the being stood out, disclosing Dasein. This is not Dasein as most Heidegger commentators present it, as a kind of mask name for the subject. Rather, this is emphasizing the existente as the da, the here, being. So that Dasein is understood as the entering the clearing, finding oneself as what is present in among everything that is already present. And it is this that, that is the possessor of humanity, more originally, that it alone, and it in its own self, um, uh, 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 is revealed as the existing being, existent in reason, uh, and that it is enabled as such. Now, in 1932, he adds a comment to this um, statement that he made from the 1930 lecture. He says, nur weil den Mensch wir längst dastehen können, only because man, humanity, we, he says, um, could for a long time stand here. This is the sense of humanity as historical humanity, humanity as having already been here, um, for a long time. Here, I think, is what Heidegger means by the, 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 the turn from being and time to time and being was in some sense contained in the 1930 lecture. I said in the remarks that we've circulated that on the one hand, Richardson describes this as a breakthrough and I've not given a full exegesis of this text, uh, but I'm hoping that in the course of the reading group, we can carry that out. But I want to stress that having got all excited, I mean, Richardson says at one point in the book, finally, in 1930, we get to the thinking of being as such. He immediately sounds a caution, a note of caution. He says, how new is the new? How new is this? So Richardson says, here we are in 1930, Heidegger too finally appears. It's intriguing to me that with this 1930 lecture and then almost within two years, as Heidegger begins to develop the notion of das Ereignis and the keeping of a whole secret series of notebooks that don't enter the public domain really, or don't even begin to enter the public domain really, until 1989, long after his death. This is the real Heidegger too. But nevertheless, this is prompted by the breakthrough that Richardson believed had been carried through in this lecture. And yet, if one attends to this carefully and understands what is being said, 
one realizes that what is released in 1949 is, as it were, still at least to some extent speaking with the language of metaphysics rather than um, uh, 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 simply presenting the understanding of being that Heidegger was developing so keenly in those other texts uh, that have really only come into the public domain long since Heidegger's death. I want to make in concluding, because I've been speaking for quite a while now, and um, Zoom is a tiring medium for all of us, just one or two further observations. One is an observation about Alithea. Uh, the seminar that um, Aaron Turner is chairing at the moment for us um, uh, 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 um, raised a question on whether or not Heidegger's etymology of Alithea as truth um, is a genuine one. And this really stems from Paul Friedlander's attack on Heidegger in his 1953 edition of his book on Plato, where he says that he, um, uh, uh, that the, the uh, etymology of Alithea as disclosure from an alpha privative of lanthanomai, of, um, uh, of hiding, as it were, is impossible. It needs to be said that this attack on Heidegger's claim uh, is, has been completely exploded. Heidegger is completely correct about the etymology. And in 1964, Friedlander wrote, uh, rewrote the entire chapter where he'd attacked Heidegger, even though Friedlander stresses he continues to disagree with Heidegger's interpretation of Plato, he has to admit that his attack on Heidegger's etymology of Adithea uh, 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 is wrong. And yet that accusation has stuck. But you will find that etymology of Alithea in Little and Scott, which is one of the most distinguished dictionaries of ancient Greek uh, around. And it was published long before Heidegger was even, uh, the first edition was published long before Heidegger was even born. And you'll find it in one of the latest uh, uh, editions of, of uh, an English language um, uh, uh, scholarly um, dictionary of ancient Greek. Uh, which is the Cambridge edition that came out, I think, last year. Um, and there it is. Uh, it, the etymology first appeared, as far as I know, in the Etymological Magnum of the 11th century. It's got a long provenance. Uh, it, 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 and yet classicists routinely name this as one of the things that Heidegger, as it were, got wrong. Heidegger's etymology of Alithea is robust. And it has a more important and more valuable provenance, one which Heidegger doesn't focus on for reasons that intrigue me, because other people do. Brentano, who Heidegger knew well, who was a profound influence on Husserl, and um, who Heidegger had read even uh, as a very young man, Brentano speaks of Aristotle's use of the veridical meaning of the verb to be, enai. And Charles Kahn draws the connection between Alithea and the veridical um, uh, use of the verb to be in his book, The, the Greek Verb to Be. Uh, Heidegger doesn't focus on this, but there is a case to be made that Alithea is relatively late, although it's mentioned in uh, Homer, mainly as Alithes, and there's a long discussion and debate around the verba dikendi, verbs, uh, as it were, um, uh, verbs of saying um, in Homer, uh, in the use of Alithea, which for my own part, I think is something of a red herring. But Alithea is clearly not widely understood as a, as a word for truth uh, in Homeric Greek. But by the time of Parmenides, clearly one of the subtexts of it's the, the goddess herself is called Alithea and one of the subtitles of the work the work was known uh, routinely as either Perifuseos uh, uh, on the things that are or the things that appear or Alithea. Uh, uh, but the second and final point um, that I want to make is that in the course of our discussion we should certainly visit the question of the correspondence theory of truth. The correspondence theory of truth is largely a medieval theory. It actually, although its best formulation in the West 
is to be found in uh, Thomas Aquinas in two places, one in his uh, Summa Theology, which is the best known work, um, but there is a second place in which it's far more importantly and more clearly defined, and that is in a work that Heidegger himself referred to frequently, it's in the Questionis Disputate De Veritate, the disputed questions concerning truth. In particular, questions one, two, and three. There are 13 questions in the book in total, but questions one, two, and three. And the most important quest, uh, a discussion of the correspondence theory of truth is in the third question, which is titled De Ideis, on the ideas. I don't want to go into depth on that um, uh, point today, although we can do in the discussion if anybody would like. But the correspondence theory of truth Aquinas himself attributed to a Jewish scholar in the Arab lands. And if you know your Aristotelian metaphysics well, and fortunately we're in touch with somebody who's not present today, but who uh, I may even get, I may even ask him to make a cameo appearance if it becomes an issue that we want to explore, um, who knows the history of the Arab preservation of the texts of Aristotle and the Arab discussion of metaphysics from which so much of Aquinas is um, uh, it, it either directly or indirectly uh, derived. But the correspondence, of theory, uh, correspondence theory of truth can be traced, and Aquinas does trace it back to a 19th century, a 9th century Jewish scholar uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 the Arab schools. And that's uh, worth uh, recalling. Heidegger himself, frequently makes reference, however, to what the correspondence theory of truth itself rests upon. And at a certain point in our discussion, I'm going to ask us to look at the only place where Heidegger discusses this in, in considerable depth. Normally, he makes it as a rather throwaway remark. In Aristotle's Perichemoneus, Aristotle defines truth in a slightly throwaway remark as the, uh, as homoios, how, um, I need to get the Greek absolutely correct, uh, homoiosis. Uh, homoiosis is the Greek for what then becomes adequatio uh, or correspondencia, uh, 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 as it were. Um, but almost never does Heidegger explain how there can be a connection between the medieval theory, which depends heavily on, uh, well, in Aquinas's case, an Abraham, a, a, a Christian metaphysics, but in the earlier case, a metaphysics which is consonant both with Islam and with Judaism, and these things are important. But how this can be so easily prefigured in Aristotle, but there is one place where he discusses it, and that is in the 1954, uh, 3, sorry, 42, 43 lectures, but volume 54 of the Gesamtaus Gaba, the lectures are the second set of lectures on Parmenides. And we may well circulate the text, it's only two or three pages, but it at least provides uh, a discussion of the history of the transition from homoiosis uh, to uh, adequatio or, cor or, or uh, correspondencia. It's at that point, therefore, that I want to conclude because it's now 10 to 5 and we have some room for, for discussion. But I hope I've given some background both to the importance of this text, the reason why we've chosen it, and where and how we might develop this discussion in the weeks, uh, in the weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, I think I might just kick off because I was reading just randomly, actually, related to something else. I was reading The Essence of Reasons um, uh, von Wiesendis Grunz. Um, and I've noticed at the start, he, there's, a, there's reference to the fact that the work was written in 1928. And then there's a third edition, which I think this is the version that Terence Malick translated in 69 that was given in or written up in 49. So is there any relation then between 
um, von Wesen der, der Wahrheit and von Wesen des Grunds, the two year difference between the original composition. And then I was just, I was just look, flicking through it now. And he, of course, starts to talk about truth in relation to the essence of, or the ground of reason, or the essence of ground. Um, or he talks about the essence of truth and he says, but the argument continues, the essence of truth lies in the connexio, or in the Greek, the symploche, uh, of subject and predicate. Thus, with explicit, though unjustified reference to Aristotle, Leibniz begins by constructing truth as truth of the assertion proposition. So is there, the, my main question, is there, is there any relation between, or is there any reason why both texts were given a third version in 1949? That's an extremely interesting question. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and in fact, the other text that we would have to include in that question is Vassis Metaphysique, because um, all three of these texts, Vassis Metaphysique, von Wesen des Grundes, and von Wesen der Wahrheit, are put together within a year of each other. And they are also revised in 1943 and again in 1949. If you know von Wesen, um, uh, 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 from Abbas's Metaphysique, you'll know that it got an introduction in 1943, and it also got a, con a conclusion in 1949, or maybe the other way around. I'm doing this off the top of my, my head. Um, and in fact, there is explicit, explicit reference um, in, uh, I think it's in section nine of von Wiesen der Wahrheit to Abbas's Metaphysique, because he says this discusses the nothing. And the question of the proposition and the proposition as ground is absolutely central to von Wiesendis Kundas. And Heidegger's theory of truth or Heidegger's uh, uh, understanding of truth is precisely the attempt to disassociate truth from the notion of the proposition. So yes, you're absolutely spot on. And that's something that we are going to have to look at in the weeks to come. Um, I noticed, by the way, that um, Shang Lai Kao has pointed out there are four versions of the uh, of the lecture in volume 80, and that's quite correct. Um, but the fourth version was never delivered in public. The fourth version is the 1940 um, version, which is very close to the 1943 version. It's it, uh, uh, it's not quite the same, and there are no paragraph uh, divisions or um, section divisions. Uh, in, in the 1940 division, or the paragraph division, sorry, are different uh, to the 1943 version. But then the 1940 version was clearly the preparatory work for um, a published version. And I wonder if uh, by 1940, it was difficult to get things published in Germany, not least because there was a shortage of paper. And believe me, this 1943 version, the paper is um, is extremely fragile. Um, uh, it, it's not, it's wartime quality paper. Um, but the three versions uh, from 1930 were all delivered in public. The 1940 version was never delivered as a public lecture. But going back to your or original question, yes, these years, 1929, 1930, 1943, and 1949 are extremely important. And other important things happen in those years. As I said, in 1949, there are the Bremen lectures. In 1929, there are the conversations in Davos uh, with Kisira and the publication of the Kant volume. The Kant volume was a reworking of an earlier set of lectures um, that Heidegger had given. It's volume 25, and I can't remember exactly which year um, uh, that was uh, they were given. Um, 1927, 1928 but he reworked them uh, and they were published in 1929. These, were, th these are almost um, marking points, uh, 1929, 30, 1932, and the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the keeping of the black notebooks. And as Peter Travny says, the first moves towards the formulation of Dasik Eignis. And then 1943, 1943, is the year in which Heidegger concluded his researches into the three ancient Greek thinkers, Parmenides, Anaximander, and um, Heraclitus. Uh, there would have been, although one of them was not delivered, but there would have been 
three lecture courses, one each on those thinkers in 1943. And I think it's not at all accidental that this lecture course was therefore finally uh, got ready for, for, uh, for release in that year. And then 1949, is a is a is a crucial year. It's the it's also the year in which I think he fully recovers from his mental breakdown of 1946, um, uh, 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 and it's the year in which he decides to put, as it were, at least an a, an element of Heidegger too for the first time into the public domain. The so I, I yes, now the the actual connections between logic itself. And, um, and Heidegger's understanding of truth, truth as the Wahrheit des Seins, des Seinden, the truth of what is present and the truth of being, Wahrheit des Seins. These are things we are going to have to consider in the coming weeks. And I think they are absolutely central to a serious interpretation of Heidegger. And they, they have received less attention than I would like personally, as a Heidegger scholar uh, from, uh, 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 from the literature, or at least as concepts in themselves, they have received less attention than I, I would have hoped, unless they are less well presented than I would have hoped. Lorenz, uh, one, one question. <clears throat> um, there is a mention somewhere in, in, the, in the essay, I don't remember in which version, mm -hmm that there was to be a second part to On the Essence of Truth, and yeah. it was going to be called On the Truth of Essence. Yes. And then he says, that failed. Mm? It failed for reasons explained in Letter and Humanism. I wonder if you could throw some light on that failure and, and what it is that the Letter and Humanism says about that. Because it seems to me that this is parallel to what happened to the second division of being and time. Mm? I think that's absolutely yes. I think that's right. That I think right. Uh, how to to do this quickly um, and easily? Something which is actually complex and and sophisticated. The writing of Van Wesen des Grundes is an attempt to assert the character of grounds themselves, and the attempt to assert the character of grounds not as the proposition, but nevertheless, although very haltingly, to seek what it is that can constitute a ground apart from the proposition itself. And in the first instance, I think Heidegger believes that time will function in that way. And for reasons that I could only touch on very briefly, um, that fails and it fails simply because time is insufficient as a ground for the ground of all things. Now, how would Heidegger want to define time? Time is the undivided, exactly as being is the undivided. But nevertheless, if you posit time as the undivided, and therefore that which can function as the unifying in and of itself, that's what the ground does, the ground unifies. Even if you posit that as an understanding of an abyss, an abyssal ground, that's after all what Heidegger argues at the end of the Kantbuch, and that's why the Kantbuch is relevant and the question of the essence of grounds is relevant. Um, there are different times. There just are different times. I mean, we speak of different epochs of different periods of history and so forth. And therefore it's clear that simply asserting time as such as the unifying, without explaining it further, this fails. So the question then becomes, is presence in itself sufficient to do the work that time might have done? Because presence, um, by presence I mean das Seiende, uh, the presently present, perhaps that also can function in that way, but that clearly also fails. In the letter on humanism, Heidegger says that the, um, the, the as it, he implies that the first time that there was an accomplishment of the transition from the essence of truth to the truth of essence is in 1937. There is a key lecture course given in 1937 
um, called, um, I'm, I'm, uh, because I'm getting tired. So I, I um, uh, um, uh, Grünfragen der Philosophie, ausgewählte Problem, Probleme der Logik, uh, winter semester of 1937-38. In that lecture, he actually speaks of the Besinnung, he says, the contemplation of the essence of truth. Besinnung be, uh, is the contemplation of the truth of essence. It's actually contained in that lecture course. And I think he believes that in that lecture course, he was able to carry through. So what, what changes, what constitutes the possibility of establishing the unifying ground, which he's already claimed must be an abgrund, an abyss? It is, as it were, the accomplishment of the understanding of Besinnung itself. Besinnung, but Besinnung in what sense? Now, one remembers that the second of the Odasseragnus notebooks is also called Besinnung. So the first of the Dasseragnus notebooks, Beiträge zur Philosophie vom Ereignis, is written in 1936 to 1938. And the second is called Besinnung. And I think that's what's being referred to in von Wiesende in, uh, in, the, in the letter on humanism. And therefore, that's why the letter on humanism refers to something that was accomplished in 1937, which is then carried through. But which is why the second half of um, von Wesen der Wahrheit could not be written in 1930, but something like it can be accomplished, um, uh, uh, let's say by 1940 or 1943. That's how I think if you want to, if you want to understand as it were, the, the, the actual working through of Heidegger's problematic, that's my understanding of it. I hope that answers your question. And, and, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, it, of course, it simply points me in the direction <laughs> because the notion of Bessinon is quite complicated. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I think Bessinon is Heidegger's own taking up of Aristotle's Sophia as the highest of the modes of truth. Now, why is that important? Why is it a Bessinon of the essence of truth? So all the four modes of Aletheorin are unified in Sophia. And the, as it were, the least of the four modes um, is, if you remember the discussion in um, uh, the uh, Platon Sophistes, the um, Sophist lectures, the least of the four modes is techne. Now it's absolutely clear from the lecture that from uh, this is why I want us to look at this discussion of homoousios um, in uh, uh, volume 54 in the 1942-43 lectures on Parmenides, because Heidegger expressly says there that what the correspondence theory of truth, what homoousis is unable to escape from um, is techne. He says, in fact, I've got, uh, um, he says, the Greek alithoeirin, to disclose the unconcealed, which in Aristotle still permeates the essence of techne. So there is, I think, in the back of his mind, um, the original Aristotelian structure of the division of the four, um, uh, uh, the, the four modes of alithoeirin. Now, if Aaron's question is correct, that all of this is concerned with the proposition, or rather with the manner of what is said, which is after all, only what the proposition is an ossified form of. So that we test not the proposition as the having been said, but die Sage, the sayings of attorney. And, and in several texts, Heidegger makes a distinction between what has been said as therefore what lies before us is what lie, lies as an already and in the past, to a what is to be said, therefore present saying, what is said in order to disclose what is, that this is the highest form. And so in a sense, we've accomplished a recovery of Sophia, of, 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 of uh, 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 as the highest mode of truth. Now, I don't think it's as, quite as simple as that. I wouldn't want to make 
and or as automatic a case as this. But the point that I would make is that Heidegger is trying to direct us towards, and I, when we come to discuss the correspondence theory, this will, I hope, become very clear, that the correspondence theory depends absolutely on a notion of techne, especially in its, um, in its Abrahamic metaphysical form uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the Arab, Jewish, and Christian schools. Um, uh, that, that, that's how it will be seen to be working. And it is that from which we must step away from in order to understand the genuine essence of truth. But when we step away from this, we keep the original in view. We're not Hegelians. We're not after an Aufhebung that annihilates what went before, but rather an Aufhebung which enables us to understand for the first time what was really going on in what went before would be my suggestion. I have another question, uh, and then and then I have something like a like a like a proposal. Mm -hmm. the, the second question is, in terms of the correspondence theory of truth, obviously, absolutely essential in this context because Heidegger wants to take a step back from that. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Aquinas, but what about the other thinkers of the 12th century, people like uh, Scotus, Ockham, Hugo of St. Victor in particular. Uh, isn't there something there that needs to be looked at mm, in terms of their own understanding of truth? I, I mean, I think um, it would be a very different reading group if we were to undertake a history of truth rather than a, a, an understanding of the essence of truth. But I think you point up something extremely important. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with um, the name Etienne Tompier. Mm, Etienne, mm. well, I, I didn't think so. Uh, Etienne Tompier <laughs> was Bishop of Paris around the time of 12, between 1270 and 1277. And he, he became extremely concerned at the influence of Islamic philosophy on Christian theologians. Um, uh, uh, so much so that he wanted uh, uh, the appearance, he wanted to condemn the appearance of something called Latin Averroism. This was a sort of Christian Islamic synthesis of metaphysics, which was more interested in metaphysics than it was in, um, in Christianity. And that really bothered Tompier. Okay. So Tompier condemned seven propositions in, 12, in, in 1270 and 277 in 1277. Now, this is absolutely crucial because it transforms, it, it actually transforms the way in which Christian thinking thinks, but it reinforces, if anything, the role of techne in the history of the understanding of truth more than anything else. So you're absolutely correct, you're, as usual, Alberto, you're spot on, like a harpoon, a harpoon thrower into the... Uh, 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 um, but um, uh, you... Um, uh, uh, but my, uh, the, the only reason I give you this little background is partly because I'm going to beg you not to make us to undertake a full history of, uh, 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 of truth between, between, let's say, between um, uh, uh, the Islamic schools and the present day. But partly to, because my own suggestion would be that, um, that techne is even further reinforced and that it's that that Scotus and Hugh of St. Victor are responding to after Aquinas's actually intriguing attempt to synthesize Christian metaphysics with Aristotle. But I think you're right. There is, there is something very important there, but it's not simply a disagreement with, um, uh, uh, with Aquinas. It's an attempt to respond to what Christianity took fright over um, in the discussion of truth uh, and made it in, in effect more metaphysical, at least would be my suggestion. Let me just say something because I am I happen to be involved in some in some deal regarding the the, the thought of, a, of an interesting guy a, a Catholic priest uh, from a Jewish ancestry called Ivan Ilik. Uh, he was very famous in the seventies, but then he went out of celebrity. Uh, and this Ivan Ilik, who was a great scholar of the twelfth century, uh, he presents. Um, 
the changes that were brought about by these great thinkers of the 12th century mm, uh, as a form of radical evil, mm, which is very interesting. Mm. Radical evil. Radical evil. Mm. Right. Radical, radical evil. Cor corruptio optimi quae est pessima, he says. Mm, okay. the, cor the corruption of the best. Mm. Uh, which, in, which introduces radical evil in, in Christian philosophy uh, in order to stay. Mm -hmm. And of course, the corruption of, uh, of Christian philosophy in the 12th century mm, uh, is very much connected to the, the theme of the death of God, you know, the fact that God becomes um, a redundant hypothesis, which of course Heidegger talks about in the first pages of The Essence of Truth. Mm. I just wanted to mention that because I think it'll come, it'll continue to come up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know Ivan. I've always known him as Ivan Illich. I'm assuming we're talking about the same person. Yeah, Ivan um, but I didn't know he was. A, I didn't know he'd been a Catholic priest. I, I, that, that, that's he, new he, he remained a Catholic priest until the end of his life. I didn't know that. Gosh, how he was he was expelled from the church by the Vatican Council because he took some positions that were too radical. He said, right. okay, I, I accept out of obedience, I will not be an active priest, but I retain my, my sacrament and I retain my priesthood, yeah. To the end of his life. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Not too well, well, relevant slightly, but it makes you wonder when exactly between 19, let's say 1926 and 1932, that Heidegger stumbles upon Parmenides, because he's clearly starting to think along the lines of, of a, a first way, um, which he's trying to uncover through these texts, especially through these three texts that we've mentioned. And the third way, which is, it is the correspondence theory of truth, I suppose, in a sense, the, you know, the way of doxa. Um, so you wonder at what point he stumbled upon Parmenides and realized, yeah, there it is, because it's not in, you know, this isn't in GA22. It's not in his, uh, the basic concepts of ancient philosophy. He hasn't got that grasp of an Aximander or Parmenides at that point. So there must happen where he goes back, he realizes what he's doing and goes back and realizes what Parmenides is doing at the same time. I, I think you're spot on. I mean, I think that that's, if I, I, the, I mean, I think why, why our reading group for the last five months has been such powerful preparation for looking at this lecture and why I think we will be able to read it in a way that it's, I, I'm, I'm, a, I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to underestimate my excitement about doing this because I think we will be able to read this um, uh, lecture course in a way it's never been read before, precisely because of the preparation that we've yeah. undertaken. Apart from um, Heidegger. Uh, and, and, that, and that is because what, what is Heidegger's point uh, uh, about Parmenides is, the only point at which he disagrees with Parmenides is the separation out of the three ways. Whereas it's clear that Heidegger believes they need to be intertwined. And in order for them to be intertwined, then something, this would be an attempt to intertwine them. That's, I think, that, that's my own reading of, of, of what's going on here. And that intertwinement is the thing that he's struggling with in these three areas, which are represented by Vasis Metaphysique, the nothing, um, from this and its grunders, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the 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 quest, if you like, for the for the um, uh, 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 for the first way, and and from this and Wahrheit, which is the unpicking, as it were, or the 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 the, the um the stepping out of the correspondence theory of truth, and that's how he in his preface. Uh, that's how he characterizes it as well. He doesn't mention obviously, because it hasn't happened yet, this text, but he says, uh, the treaty is the essence of reason, so von Wesen des Grunds was written in 1928, at the same time as the lecture, what is metaphysics? The latter considers, so what is metaphysics, uh, considers the problem of nothingness, while the former defines the ontological difference. Yeah, yeah, there you have it. Should we wrap it up there for this week? May, may, I, have, may I say one thing? Mm -hmm. Of because it seems to me that, uh, I mean, talking about the Kere, right? There is a mention of the Kere in, in uh, Essence of Truth, mm, which I take to be a reference to the fact that Heidegger himself mm, was introducing a Kere in the history of metaphysics. In other words, the notion of the Kere doesn't refer to any change internal to, to Heidegger's own thinking. Mm, 
but it refers to the fact that he is announcing his own position as a turn uh, in, within the history of metaphysics. He has, he has said a few pages earlier, Kant, Kant introduces the last epoch of metaphysics. Mm? And then he says, the Kerry. Mm? Okay, the Kerry is Heidegger's thinking vis-a-vis mm? -vis Kant, not Heidegger's two versus Heidegger one. Mm? Yeah, yeah. Right. That's the way I understand the, the mention of the Kerry in on the essence of truth. Mm? I, I would agree with you very strongly. Having just mm. worked through, I reread, I decided to reread the Kant book because I haven't read it probably for 25 years in the last few months. And but partly because I have found myself bumping up against Heidegger's Kant interpretation over and over again uh, in the last months. And I, I think you're absolutely correct. And if you look at Heidegger's references to the abyss, uh, even in the Kant book, it becomes blisteringly clear uh, how he addresses the question of grounds and how that he believes Kant both to have seen and not seen what the question of grounds is um, in um, the, especially the first critique. But he uses the third critique to comment on the first critique in the most intriguing way, especially in the lecture, in the essay, sorry, in 1961 um, on Kant's um, concept of being. Um, which Leslie and I are going to be looking at at some time fairly soon, which is now you know why, why, why I've pushed you in that direction, Leslie. But I, I think it's, it's because you can't understand Das Gestell without understanding this background. And I think you've absolutely put your finger on it. And so has Aaron. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Lawrence, for your presentation today. Um, We'll meet again same time next week. I'll email out details of what exactly we're going to cover, I suppose, in week one, because we haven't discussed that yet, have we? No, we'll make some suggestions. And mm, I think yeah. by then, Aaron and I should have conquered the question of a, of a web page um, uh, and some things to download. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. See you next Thank week. You. Mm, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.